All right, we're going to look at this study from Kling and Horowitz from 1851. Both strong players in their own right, but known for compositions. This study is uh, uh, set up for white to move. And as usual, if you want, pause the video, set up the board, and think about what you will play as the white pieces. Okay, let's get into the analysis. Now, this is an interesting position when you first glance at it. I mean, if you were at a tournament and you seen this position at the board, you would just assume that white is probably busted with those two passed pawns on A3 and uh, B2. Bearing down on White King. White King is pretty much trapped. And can't really move anywhere. Because the B pawn would just queen. Immediately. Um, Black's pawns. Otherwise look healthy enough. Right. And meanwhile White has his double pawns. On the F file. And, um, and a G. And E. And C pawns. You know it looks like. Um. You know, the white king, excuse me, the black king would just come down, say, A7, play A5, and, uh, excuse me, A7, um, B6, and just pick up the C pawn, and, you know, the game should be over shortly. So, that lets us know that with white, the move, this move is critical. You know, this is, this is critical here. Um, one thing to notice about the white's, uh, black's position, rather, is that the king is in the corner. You know, the king is way over on a8. And another feature is the um, to bring out another point to bring out is the four to three kingside pawn majority that white holds here. All right. So if I'm white, I know I can't move my king. Right, except the b1, and if I move the b1. Then, um, you know, I don't see any uh, any further prospects uh, for white. The game is probably uh, over. Say, I have to move like e6. Okay. So, if you've been looking at my other videos in this series, you will notice that when there's um, a single pawn on the um, second rank, whether it's, uh, in this case, black, the seventh rank or white the second rank there's a single pawn there defending right here and you have these two pawns you should be looking for a sacrifice in order to exploit this and this is what I mean in this position f5 is a great move here why let's look the G takes f5 now you see what I'm talking about. E6 forces the hand of black. Black cannot just push F6 because this pawn will then go G6 and G7 and queen. The king is too far away to have any say in the matter. If F takes E6 again, then G6. Okay, that's the idea. Anytime you see this type of scenario, and this is why, again, this everything in chess is connected. This is why space is important in chess. Because when you have space, in this case, white has more space on the king side with these pawns being on the fifth thing. When you have space, it allows for these type of um, uh, combinations to take place. So F5 should spring in your head immediately. Okay. So F5, and that's the idea, right? G takes F5, then E6, and notice not G6, right? Because then he just captures, but E6. And what that does is this pawn is overworked. The F pawn cannot stop the G pawn and the E pawn at the same time. So that should be your main idea. So now when you're contemplating this position, you know you can't play a move like King B1 because then, I say King B1, E6, and you're definitely 
um, dead in the water. Okay, so e6. Excuse me, f5. So after f5, we already showed that this is winning for white. Like what a change, what a turn of the tables. But instead of that inferior move being played by black, black simply plays e6. Right, and this throws a monkey wrench in the plans of white because not only is it uh you know not capturing like white wanted, but now threatening just to simply capture the pawn. So you have no choice; either you take uh, e6 or g6. Right? You definitely don't want to push the pawn, right? So okay, f takes e6. F takes e6. <clears throat> now what? Okay. Well, you're pretty much in Zug's wing here. You don't want to play, again, king b7. Because that makes no progress whatsoever. And you only can go back and forth, back and forth. Alright, so... You had the same idea. You had the king far away. And imagine, if you will, if you were able to take this pawn and put it right here. Again... Black is faced with the same dilemma where he has to either capture this way or capture that way. No matter which way he captures, a passed pawn appears on the board for white. So that should let you know right away that F4 is the correct move. Now, King B8 because the black king has to rush to the aid. And now F5. Now white, uh, black has no time to move his king again, so he has to capture. And he plays e takes f5. And now e6. King c7. And now e7. And just like that, guess who's winning the game? And now you see the purpose of having the c pawn and the c pawns in the the in the um. You know, in this composition, right? It creates this uh, situation where the black king cannot stop the pawn. Okay. Again, all of that is just to show you this motif, right? Again, about the um, the pawn majorities, and also showing you the weakness. You know, in the um, you know, when the king is all the way on the side of the board, and you have space against your opponent, all right. Always look for a situation like this, uh, the sack pawns. Like I said, when you had that one defender in the back, you know, like I said, this is the main idea. Once you see this, this idea, you know, this is correct. And then once once he plays e6, then it's kind of like. You know, the same idea is, is there. G4, G5, one of these pawns has to capture. And you got it. If he takes with the other pawn, you just, you know, play G6. So the same, same scenario. Alright, so again, it shows you that, you know, each position, you know, has its little nuances and even in a seemingly seem seemingly hopeless position that there is sometimes a way out so again this move f5 very powerful move and um so that's it for that particular composition